Hey guys, welcome back. Today I have for you one of the weirdest and most interesting pieces of equipment ever made, in my opinion. A lock-in amplifier. This one in particular is the Stanford Research Systems Model 830 DSP lock-in amplifier. Uh, the Signal Path did a video a while back on the Model 530, which was basically just about the same thing but it didn't have the bar graph displays that you're seeing it had view meters so what we have here now is the same demonstration he basically did a while back we have an input going into the trans impedance amplifier um, the uh, amplifier is basically set up to measure current at the input with a reasonably short time constant and where does that current come from? Well, we can see that the reference generator is set to output around 250 millivolts-ish, doesn't matter much, at a frequency of 1 kilohertz. Uh, this is the same frequency that the lock-in amplifier will look for when trying to pick out the signal from the massive amount of noise it's seeing. So you can see that we're measuring around uh, 0.06 nanoampere, which is basically 60 picoamps. And as I increase the amplitude of the signal uh, of, of the sine wave oscillator, you can see the current increasing. Well, why is that? Well, the device um, is powering actually an LED, which is uh, shining on another LED, which is connected to the input of the lock-in amplifier. If I unplug the uh, output towards the light, you can see the current drops to basically the noise floor of the device. And if I plug it back in, you'll see that it shoots back up. So here we have the LEDs. The right side one is the emitter. The left side one is the receiver. And you'll see that if I increase the amplitude, you might be able to make it out um, as it gets brighter and dimmer. So the left LED is directly connected through an oscilloscope probe to the input of the device. Um, the probe is set to times one, same for the uh, source, so the right LED. And we're seeing that the lock-in amplifier is locking in basically to its own um, sine wave and filtering out all the noise. How does this thing work? Well, in short, it's a... Um, it's got a front end, which in this in the case of this device was broken, uh, which amplifies the signal by a gain of seven and then passes it through a bank of filters. And then it gets digitized and put into a DSP, which uh, synchronizes itself with the reference sine wave and it filters out everything apart from any signal on that sp uh, of that specific frequency. Um, this is basically cheating, but this is how you can get extremely large uh, uh, quality factor filters. Basically, this thing is a, a bandpass filter that can have a bandpass frequency of under a hertz, less than a hertz, much less than a hertz, actually. I'm going to link the manual with the full schematics uh, in the description so you can check it out for yourself. Um, I don't know enough about this device to uh, do it justice, but I can tell you what was wrong with it and what I did to fix it. Right? So, um, yeah, let's get started. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is take off the top cover, and we're greeted by a mostly empty device. Um, it's r much larger than it should be. Um, I suspect that is because that's a standard form factor chassis they used. But the device is very cleanish inside and uh, has quite a lot of shielding on the analog section. The board on the left is the power supply section and the digital section, not the DSP, but the main processor section for the entire device. Uh, the power supply is made out of that uh, transformer over there with uh, uh, an input mains filter underneath that brownish shield. Um, there's a bunch of capacitors filtering the output from the bridge rectifier, which is made out of discrete diodes placed in front of this fan. 
that's a very weird way of doing it um, but I assume that mm, they had their reasons to do this the fan is cooling that shroud which is connected uh, which is heat sinking the various voltage regulators that generate the various regulated rails for the rest of the device there's a plus minus 12 a plus minus 5 and a plus minus 20 um, this board is mainly just housing the digital electronics, um, the main processor, the ROM, and some glue logic. And that's, mm, there's a bodge board that is probably housing a replacement part they didn't have um, in the required footprint. Uh, there's also a backup battery, which is luckily still intact in this device bottom left corner there's a crystal oscillator for the main processor and ribbon cables galore going to the rest of the device <coughs> and there's some outputs on the back on that uh, dedicated board but that's not very important speaking of the back there's the transformer shield the input power socket the clunkiest power switch i've ever seen and some auxiliary inputs and outputs which do various things depending on what you need it to do uh, there's a fuse holder, an RS-232 interface, a uh, GPIB port, and a preamp input for a preamp that I don't have. Uh, inside, you can already see a bit of the analog circuitry and um, ADCs. They're underneath the first shield. Um, and on the bottom board, there is uh, actually the second shield that shields the front of the, the, uh, front end of the device. Um, the other side has some bunch of uh, local regulation um, and um, a crystal oscillator for the DSP. Um, there's the front end uh, with some very hard to reach trim potentiometers that set the volt, uh, the offset, um, the common model rejection ratio and uh, the current offset. The back of the main board is pretty reasonably standard. Uh, looks a bit auto routed, and there's uh, test points for a lot of um, uh, a lot of the power lines, and um, this ribbon cable basically transfers all of the voltage rails from the main from the power supply board to the front two boards. If we remove the shield, we can see the top board which uh, houses the DSP, the ADCs, uh, the DAC for the um, uh, s reference signal generator and there's a cameo from my cat I, he's actually the mastermind behind everything hello cat and um, some more pre uh, post regulation um, the Motorola DSP which is the DSP 5602 um, and I think those are the ROMs for it or something. I'm not entirely sure. There is a schematic, but I haven't been snooping around here that much. Uh, if we take that board out, we can see the analog preamplifier, uh, the front end board and the first stage of filtering. This, this basically takes the input from the device and um, does some crazy stuff to it. Um, that Burr Brown uh, IC is uh, the main ADC and those are the voltage regulators that power this board. Um, if we take the shielded can out, uh, the sh all, all of this board out, you'll be able to see the main source of problem of this instrument, which is the front end. If you look closely, you're going to see that there are a few non-standard parts here. So in my quest of repairing this device, I've actually changed a few parts that are actually good, uh, two op amps mainly. Um, they turned out not to be the problem, but one of the matched pair of JFES was. So you can see there's an IF3602 in place of where an LSK2389 uh, should be. That was one of the, uh, that was the uh, matched JFET pair responsible for um, the front end preamplifier, uh, and it was dead. Uh, somebody actually went in here before me and replaced one of those relays. The white one isn't original, um, and probably in doing that, damaged one of the JFET pairs. They're very fragile. Um, 
So I just happened to have one of those crazy interfet matched JFET pairs for a project that I was working on. And it turned out to be a pink compatible replacement. And um, yeah, swapping it out brought back the device to life, which is crazy. Um, but it, if I can save it for the from the trash bin, that's great. Um, this entire assembly is shielded, is um, very temperature sensitive, so you have to wait for the device to warm up fully before setting the offsets and the uh, CMRR. Um, it's very hard to properly troubleshoot and replacing components on this board was a nightmare because the holes for the pins are very small and um, you risk ripping the vias out every time you take a component out. So what was wrong with this device? Well, when I got it, um, I ran it through the performance checklist in the manual and the input offset was unacceptable. It was like two or 300 millivolts and it's specified to be under a, mil under a millivolt. So this is it after the repair and you can see that it's um, um, working just fine and yeah, thanks for watching.